Hello everyone, welcome to Adams and Sporks, and in this video we're going to do something a little different. I want to talk about three things that Hollywood really doesn't seem to understand about basic physics. And right off the top, don't get me wrong here, this is just a bit of fun. A lot of the movies that commit some of these physics sins I really love. But they can also still have parts where, you know, as someone who passed middle school science class, your suspension of disbelief can get blown to smithereens at times. So with that said, let's have a bit of fun and look at three of Hollywood's favorite things that'll make you go, yeah, that's not how that works. So our first bit of hokey Hollywood hokum is that movies and TV shows really, really don't seem to understand what airlocks are. Now, we've all seen these kinds of scenes. You know, the surly space pirates mutiny and chuck their no-good captain into the antechamber before blowing him out the airlock. Or, an irate passenger on a plane yanks open the plane door during flight, depressurizing and usually killing everyone on board. Except these things are impossible. You see, the idea of an airlock is really very simple. We on planet Earth don't really notice it because we evolved on this planet under these conditions, but we live our entire lives under a pretty high amount of pressure. At sea level, for example, for every square meter, air pressure is pressing on it with a kind of incredible 10,000 kilograms or 20,000 pounds of weight. Now, like I said, we don't really notice this because we're used to it. Our bodies are made mostly of water, which, as a fluid, is extremely incompressible. And if we move something like, say, opening a door, we don't actually feel this force. And that's because this force is the same on both sides of the door, so the net force of pressure acting on either side cancels out. But the flip side to this is that if you have a door where only one side is at Earth atmospheric pressure and the other side side is at a much lower pressure, then you only need one teeny tiny thing to keep that door closed. And in fact, you can keep it held shut so tightly that you prevent any air from escaping around its edges. All you need is for the door to have a lip on the high pressure side. That's it. With the slip, if one side is at vacuum, you'll have this incredible weight of 10,000 kilos or 20,000 pounds pushing on each square meter of that door, helping to hold it closed. You know, you may have noticed that airlocks have this fancy locking mechanism, but that's only for holding the door shut when you're repressurizing the one side. But once you have that pressure difference, the lip and natural air pressure does all the work in making a good seal. Similarly, for something like a plane at cruising altitude, it may not be a perfect vacuum outside like in space, but at that altitude, air pressure is still about half that of sea level. Plus, plane doors are bigger, so the more surface area, the more total force you need to open. So if you were ever scared on a plane that someone could just run up and yank that door open, don't be. Opening that door would be like deadlifting six cars. Even if you like genetically combine like the rock with the mountain from Game of Thrones, that door is not opening. And also, sorry, but you can't blow someone out in an airlock. The door simply can't be opened under pressure. So, you know, in reality, your space pirate would brutally suffocate over a series of agonizing minutes as air is slowly pumped out of the antechamber to match pressure with the outside. Which, you know, is also probably a pretty cinematic death. Though I do feel like I should throw maybe a small disclaimer here. Not a hundred percent of all doors found in aviation and space technology are these so-called plug doors, where a rim or a wedge shape plus pressurization helps keep the door closed. For example, because a plug door must always open inwards, for the cargo doors of a plane, they're not ideal. You're wasting valuable cargo space keeping free room for the door to be open. So these doors instead open outwards and are basically bolted shut before takeoff. Okay, so moving on from airlocks to our next bit of tenuous Tinseltown teachings, space really isn't that cold. At least not how Hollywood thinks. Now, right away, I know this might seem wrong. You can just Google the temperature of space and you'll get a number. Like space is only three degrees above absolute zero, the coldest possible temperature. So what am I even on about? 
Well, a good way of thinking about what temperature actually is, like what it physically represents, is basically the average amount of motion or average speed of the atoms in a material. And that's why we have an absolute zero at all. It's the temperature where the atoms are still and have no motion. You can't have less speed than no speed. But then here's the rub. Space is also a vacuum. It doesn't have any atoms in it. There's nothing there. I mean, technically there's the occasional atom, like one atom per cubic meter or per cubic centimeter, but it's pretty darn empty. So then given that, how can we even assign a temperature to it at all? Well, it's really a story for a whole other video, but this three degrees above absolute zero is really the temperature of what is called the cosmic background radiation. This background radiation is light that permeates everywhere in the universe and is a remnant from the Big Bang. And because it's everywhere, any object that has a temperature less than three degrees above absolute zero will basically be heated up by this light until it reaches an equilibrium at that three degrees temperature. But Again, that's, that's really a story for another time. The point is space is empty. And this ultra cold temperature number you might see quoted is really, really misleading. And it's misleading because when we think about how cold affects our fragile, squishy human bodies, we often confuse temperature with what's really the rate of heat flow. Like if you take a hot metal pan out of the oven, it can immediately burn you, trust me but it will also cool very quickly. On the other hand, if you have a high quality thermos, you know, one of those ones that has like an air layer, or even sometimes a vacuum layer between the inner and outer parts, you can pour boiling hot liquid in there and not only will it stay hot for a very long time, but the outer surface will be cool or like mildly warm to the touch. So even if the metal pan and the hot liquid were the same temperature, the effect on your body is very different. And that's because the rate which heat flows is very different. With the thermos, there's an insulator separating you from the hot stuff. And even though it's very hot, the rate at which that heat transfers to you is incredibly slow. In space, things are the extreme of that. There is no convection of heat and there is no conduction of heat because there's no air or atoms to convect or conduct through. That's why on a spacecraft, the big issue is not the astronauts freezing, but rather them boiling. Because any heat generated by the spacecraft, you know, from its engines or computers or the squishy warm-blooded astronauts inside, well, it's really hard to get rid of that heat. That's why things like the International Space Stations have these huge thermal fins with large surface area. Without conduction or convection, the only way to bleed off heat is through the thermal emission of light. And that's what these are for. They're bleeding off heat as infrared lights, which is a very slow process. And that brings us to Hollywood. We've seen these scenes a thousand times in a thousand places. For some reason, the first example that pops into my head was when Tim Robbins dies in that early 2000s movie, Mission to Mars, which never watched, by the way, it's bad. But astronaut gets exposed to space, instantly turns into a human popsicle. But in reality, the only cold effects you're going to see is actually due to evaporation. When liquid evaporates, the liquid it leaves behind is cooler. This is literally how fans keep Keep us cool with our sweats. And evaporation does proceed very rapidly when exposed to vacuum. But that's at most going to cause your sweat to freeze and, you know, maybe form a thin layer of ice on your eyeballs, which, ouch, but it's not going to make you into an ice sculpture just some light surface freezing. No, what's really gonna happen is all your capillaries are going to burst before air is forced out of your lungs and you suffocate to death over a certain amount of time. Which is, I don't know, better? But sorry, no instant human ice cube. And that brings us to our final fit of fraudulent phony physics. Hollywood really doesn't seem to understand the point of armor. And of course, the worst offender here is probably Iron Man. And don't get me wrong, I'm a big MCU fan, but really, this is about Hollywood not really understanding the concepts, nay, the very basic idea of force. Now, the point of armor is to be a rigid, inflexible, non-deformable layer that prevents a sharp object like a bullet or a sword from getting inside your fragile fleshy bits. Again, let's notice those words. Rigid, inflexible, non-deformable, and it prevents penetration by a fast-moving sharp object. 
On the other hand, if you say fall from a great height or, you know, thrown into a brick wall, what is hurting you there is something very, very different. It's not a sharp object stabbing through your skin, it's the force of impact. You see, when you're first falling or throwing, you have some incredibly high velocity. And then that velocity changes from that initial value to zero very, very quickly when you impact something hard like the ground or a wall. The faster that overall change in velocity happens, in other words, the shorter the period of time that change in speed occurs, the higher the force you're going to experience and the more it's going to kill you. Force is directly proportional to the amount of deceleration you experience, change in velocity per unit time. This is precisely why modern cars have so-called crumple zones. These cars are designed so that when they suffer an impact, the time it takes for them to be brought to a stop is made as long as possible. By having the front of the car crumple and give and deform rather than remaining rigid. So to survive falls, throws, and impacts, and really even punches, what you want is to be encased in a soft, flexible material with a lot of give. And we've seen inside Iron Man's armor, there is no padding in there. In fact, it looks really uncomfortable. So it doesn't matter how strong his armor is or what it's made of, be it steel or fictional unbreakable materials like adamantium or vibranium, the criteria for what makes a good armor, which is being hard and rigid, is the exact opposite of what makes material good at protecting against falls and impacts. So like in these scenes, Iron Man's dead. And I know, I'm a big nerd too, I, I know there are throwaway lines in the MCU movies saying things like vibranium is a magical material that absorbs any vibrations or what have you. But I mean, first of all, that's clearly not true since we know Captain America's shield is made from it and we hear it like dong, dong, vibrating sounds all the time as it bounces off things or gets hit. But more importantly, we could interpret this absorb vibrations line to mean that this material is very good at converting kinetic energy into vibrational energy that then quickly damps out to make heat. I mean, I know this is just meant as like a meaningless technobabble line, but thinking in good faith, let's assume that's what they meant. The thing is that even if a collision, like Thor's hammer hitting Cap's shield, doesn't conserve kinetic energy, if it's a so-called inelastic collision, well, it still actually conserves the transference of force, what is called the conservation of momentum. So vibranium or not, you'll still feel the entire force of a thunder god hitting you with a magical hammer in your wrist and arm. But okay, so those are our three physics things Hollywood always gets wrong, and obviously there are many, many more we could talk about. So let me know in the comments if you like these kind of videos. I'm, I'm always trying to add variety to my content and try new things. I hope you enjoyed it. It was all in good fun, and have a good one.